Hey, what's up coders? I'm Coderius and today we will implement the A-star algorithm with the Bust compiler in Unity. A-star is a very efficient search algorithm used in many fields of computer science and for us game developers, it is mostly used as a pathfinding algorithm. The pathfinding is the logic that brings a character from point A to point B without hitting obstacles. In this video, we will use the Unity grid and a tile map to implement the A-star algorithm for 2D games. Before we start, take a moment to like and subscribe, and I see you in Unity. First of all, a little bit of theory to explain how A-star works. I've added links in the description with more details. As mentioned earlier, the goal is to find a way from point A to point B. In our grid system, we define a start node and an end node and write their respective coordinates we will use three main values. The G-score, which is the real distance from the start to a specific node. The H-score, which is the estimation of the distance between a specific node and the end node. And the F-score, which is the sum of the G and the H. H stands for the heuristic, and there are several ways to estimate the distance to the goal. In this video, I will stick to Euclidean heuristic. It is very convenient in a grid system, as we can easily calculate the bird's eye distance between two nodes. As a side note, I use square distances in the code, which has two main advantages. We avoid doing costly square root operations, and using integers is also faster. Alright, we begin with the start node. Its G-score is 0. Its H-score is the squared distance to the goal. If you recall your classes, to calculate the hypotenuse, we take the square root of A squared plus B squared. Here we do the same without the square root. That will be 3 squared plus 3 squared equals 18. The F-score is the sum of G and H, therefore 18 as well. Ok, next we check one by one all the neighbors that are not obstacles and that we haven't yet visited, and calculate their G, H and F-scores. From this list of nodes, we look for the one with the best potential, or the one that has the lower F-score. Once we found the next node, we define the previous node as parent, so we can trace back where we're coming from. And then we just repeat the operation over and over until we have reached the final destination or until there is no more node to visit. Alright, let's start with a new 2D project. We need the Unity Collection package, which is in preview, and there is a little trick to add it. In the Package Manager, click Add Package from Git URL, and in there type in com.unity.collections. As mentioned in the intro, we use a rectangular tile map. I added a gap of 0.25 between the grid cells for a better visualization. We will need the default tile. We can easily create a white tile of 256 by 256 with paint or any drawing software. We can then save the image in the asset folder. In Unity, make sure the pixels per unit of the sprite is the same as the size of the image we just created, here 256 pixels. Then we create the tile. For that, in the window menu, let's display the tile palette. Create a new palette, call it Tile, and save it somewhere in the project. As always, better stay organized and save the tile-related stuff in a specific folder. Now in the Tile palette, we can simply drag and drop our white sprite somewhere in the palette and save the newly created tile in the project. We can then create a new empty game object, call it Pathfinder, and add a new c -sharp script with the same name. We can start editing it in Visual Studio. So, this program uses the job system and will be compiled with Burst. If you are not familiar with the code structure, you might want to look at my model board set video where I explain the job system and multithreading in more details. We will need to add references to a few namespaces. The Unity Engine tile maps, the Unity Mathematics, Unity Jobs, Unity Burst, and finally, Unity Collections. First, let's create a struct to store information of the tiles we will visit along the way. A node will store the x and y coordinates of the tile in the form of an int2. Like a vector 3 contains 3 flows, an int2 contains 2 integers. Easy. We also store the coordinates of the parent node, as well as the g-score and h-score as explained earlier. The f-score will be calculated later on. That's it for the node. We also need a list of int2 for our obstacles. I use a hash table with an int2 as key and boolean as value, to tell if the tile is an obstacle or not. We also want a reference to the start node and end node. And as the grid is infinite, let's define a threshold for how many times our pathfinder will iterate before giving up on finding a path. 
just avoid being stuck in an infinite loop in case there is no way between the start and the end node. Alright, we also need references to our in-game components. That's the tile map, the default tile and the camera. In our start function we initialize our obstacle hash table and give a default value to our start and end nodes. int.0 for the coordinates and the parent coordinates. And we also use the max value of the integer for the g-score and h-score. So far so good, we will start slowly and first build our controls and interface before writing the main algorithm. So let's write some code to define the start and end node as well as placing obstacles. Let's start with the starting point. We can create a new void function, call it place start. We get the current position of the mouse on the screen in a vector 3 with the function screen to world point, which takes the input.mouse position as parameter. Vector 3 are storing flows, but the cells of a tile map are using integers. We convert our world position to a cell position with the function world to cell from the tile map and provide the world position as an argument. We can save this in a vector 3 int variable. But remember, our structs will use int2, so we extract the x and y values from our vector3 int and save them in an int2. Easy. We can update our start node with the new coordinates and color the respective cell in green. Before that, we need to delete the previous starting point by setting the current tile of the start node to null. Then we set the new tile of the new start node with our default tile, change the tile flag to none as colors are locked by default and then we can finally set the color of the tile to green with set color. Let's then call this newly created function in the update when shift and left click are pressed. Let's give it a try. Great, we can now place our start node. Ok, we can duplicate this function, change the name to place end and change the assignment to the end node instead of the start node. And let's use the color red instead of green. We can then call the function in the update loop with the left click plus control. Excellent, we can now place our end and start nodes. Placing obstacles is quite the same, but we need to update our hash table and remove the obstacle when we click on a tile that has already an obstacle. I'll paint obstacles in black, but feel free to use any color. So, to check if the tile is already an obstacle, we can just check if the hash table contains the coordinates. In case the tile is already an obstacle, we set the tile to null and remove the obstacle from the hash table. Else we check if we are not placing an obstacle on the start or end node. And in case the tile is empty, we paint the tile in black and add it to the obstacle list. Let's also quickly update our place end and place start to make sure we are not placing the nodes on an existing obstacle or placing the start on the end node and vice versa. Let's then add the place obstacle function in the update loop when the left mouse button is clicked. We must also check that the shift and control keys are actually not pressed during the frame as the program will be confused. Awesome, we can now create a tile map with a start point, the goal and obstacles. Ok, we are now set up with the interface and can actually start coding the algorithm. We can't really try the code as we write, so you will have to follow along. There is a copy of the program on Coderius GitHub in any case. So we said earlier that this code uses the job system, therefore we start by creating a new public struct, call it a star and implement ijob. We then need references to the data used to calculate the path. The job system uses native containers. I use native hash maps as it's very convenient to find nodes with their unique coordinates, used as a key. We need a hash map for the obstacles, one for the global list of nodes and one for the list of nodes to be tested. We also use a native array for offsets to iterate through neighboring nodes as we will see in a moment. And as input we also need the start and end nodes as well as our safeguard number. When we implement iJob, we must have a public void function execute that contains the main instructions. But before writing stuff in there, we need some utility functions. 
Using the job system and the bus compiler, we don't have access to all the functions of Unity, so we have to write some of them separately. Let's start with the function to calculate the square distance between the two ties using Pythagoras. Just below the execute function, let's create a new public int function and call it square distance. It takes two int two coordinates as parameter. You remember from your class that the hypotenuse is the square root of a squared plus b squared. As we don't want to perform square root operations because it is slow, we'll just return a squared plus b squared, where a is the difference between the x coordinates and b the difference between the y coordinates. In the second utility function, we return the node with potential for being the best root. To identify this node, we will iterate through the open set and return the one with the lower f score. So, we start by creating a new node and a new int with max value. As of today, there is no way to iterate through a native hash map, so we must first get all our values and put them in an array. Fortunately, there is the function getValueArray that returns an array with all values. We can create a new native array of nodes, call it nodeArray, and extract the values from the open set with getValueArray. Then we just loop through our array, and if the f-score of the node is lower than our current lowest value, we update the result and the potentially lower f-score. At the end, we dispose of the node array and return the coordinates. Alright, back to our execute function, we can start writing the algorithm. Create a new node, call it current, and copy the start node in it. At start, the g-score is 0, and the h-score is the square distance between the start and the end. Then we can add the current node to the open set. With try add, we make sure that we don't add a key that already exists. We will also initiate our offsets to cover the 8 directions around our current node. Let's also have a counter initialized with a value of 0. We will use the counter as circuit breaker when the number of iterations exceeds the safeguard value. Great, our main loop will run as long as there are nodes in the open set. We use a do-while loop to achieve that. As mentioned in the theory, we start with the node that has the highest potential, or the one that is closer to the end node. So our current node becomes the closest node, and we add it to our global node list. Then we look at the 8 adjacent cells and look for nodes that haven't yet been visited, and that are not obstacles. Alright, if our neighbor is a valid node, we create a new node, call it neighbor, and instantiate it with the current coordinates, plus the offset, and our current node becomes the parent. This part is a bit wordy, but it's quite simple. The g-score is the g-score of the parent, plus the distance to the neighbor. The h-score is the distance from the neighbor to the go. We check if this neighbor is already in our open set, and if that's the case, we update the node only if the g-value is lower than the existing record. If the neighbor is not in the open set, we add it. That's it for the for loop. Once we have checked the 8 neighbors, we can remove the node from the open set and increment our counter. Then we check if we are still within the maximum number of authorized iteration, and that's basically it. The A star algorithm is not more complicated than that. To find the path from A to B, we need to execute our algorithm. We create a new void function and call it findPath. We start with the initialization of the various hash maps used by the program. We need a native hash map with int2 and boolean types for the obstacles and can initialize it with the size of our original obstacle hash table. We need native hash maps for the nodes and the open set. Key value pairs are composed of int2s and nodes and with the size equal to the safeguard value. Last, we create the native array that will be used for the offsets with a size of 8. Alright, we need to transpose the obstacles from the hash table to the hash map. So we loop through the keys of the obstacles and copy them in the isObstacle hash map with true as values. Then we create a new A star struct, call it a star with a small a, and pass on the values. After that we create the job handle, schedule the job and run it. Great, in the next step we will color all tiles visited by the algorithm in white. 
As we've seen already, we can't iterate the hash map. So we copy the nodes in a new array, then we loop through the array of nodes and save the coordinates of each node as a vector 3 int. We then color the tiles in white as long as they are not the start or end node or an obstacle. Ok, we are almost there. We want to check if we actually found a path. For that we check if the main hash map contains the coordinates of the end node. And in that case, it means we found a path from A to B. Then we just find our way back until we reach the starting point with a while loop. We save the coordinates of the node in an int2 and in a while loop we get the parent node and set the tile to green. The same way we have colored other tiles. Before closing the function, don't forget to dispose of the various native containers and we can call this function when space is pressed in the update loop. Alright, if you try the program at this stage, you will quickly realize that it's messy. We just need to clean up the tile map between two activations. Let's create a new void function, call it clear tiles. In there, we start by cleaning all the tiles with clear all tiles. Then we reset the start and end node, and we loop through the keys of our obstacle hash table and set them back in black. And that's it. Alright, let's give it a try. Define a start point and an end point, and if we press space, our algorithm will find a way. We can play around a bit and add some obstacles. I love to see how the algorithm will always find a way. Let's measure the performance. In the update function, we take the start time before running the find path function, and we save the time after the execution. Then we display the difference in the console. It's quite fast, it takes only a few milliseconds depending on the complexity of the path to find. And well, this is bus ready and we can compile this job with the bus compiler by adding these keywords on top of the job. To speed up the process even more, we can also exit the loop as soon as we have found the goal. It won't always be the shortest path, but in most cases that should just do the job and reduce the execution to a fraction of millisecond. Alright, it's already the end of the video, I hope you liked it. If that's the case, thank you for giving a thumbs up and wind up subscribing to the channel. As you see, A star algorithm is a fantastic piece of code that is used in many video games. I have implemented it in a 2D strategy game, and you can see here, recasting, checking for obstacles. And this works really fine for one unit, but you can think of having a multi-threaded version of the program and run the pathfinding for various units across various threads. The current version of the program is almost there. There would be only a few things to change to upgrade the code to a multi-threaded version. We've done that already with the model board set, if you remember. You could also think about running this on the GPU with a compute shader. Let me know what you think in the comment section and if you would like to see more videos about A-Star. And that's where I'll leave you for today. Thank you very much for watching, keep coding, and see you next time.